Um, so my name is Melissa Lott, and I'm a senior research scholar here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. I joined last month after a stint uh, abroad for seven years in Asia and Europe, um, and then before that, the US Department of Energy. This morning, we're going to be discussing Equinor's Energy Perspectives 2019, and we're going to be stepping through this report, which is intended really to provide a helicopter view of how the global energy economy could develop. Um, as we know, the energy economy is a key part of the overall global economy. So understanding where we could go and what decisions we need to make in the short, medium, and longer term, if we want to be on a certain uh, trajectory, is, is quite interesting and important. And today, we'll have Equinor's uh, perspective on this. So let me first quickly say that this event is being webcast live. Uh, the full video will be available on Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy website in the coming days. Um, for those of you who are watching online right now, please remember that uh, you can ask a question of the panelists at any time using the CGEP events um, hashtag, so hashtag CGEP, C-G-E-P events, and the Twitter handle, which is at Columbia U Energy. Um, in terms of questions, what we're going to do is have our speaker speak through his presentation, and then we'll take questions both within the room and from people online. So today we're joined by Eirik Varnes. Uh, so he's Equinor's Senior Vice President for Macroeconomics and Market Analysis, Chief Economist and Head of Strategy and Marketing, Midstream and Processing. And he's got a broad experience across government, academia, and the private sector companies, which we're actually speaking about this morning with a group of students here at Columbia and how his, his uh, career has developed. He currently serves as a non-executive board member of Innovation Norway and a non-resident fellow at the Payne Institute at the Colorado School of Mines. And in 2018, Eric served as a member of IRENA's Global Commission on the Geopolitics of Energy. And one of the scenarios we'll talk about today really looks at this geopolitics and the effects of that on the future of the energy system. Uh, he, in 2018, he was also a non-executive member of the board of the Norwegian Financial Supervisory Authority, and he worked with the World Economic Forum in different working groups and as an expert advisor from 2014 to 2018, and served as an executive board member at the Central Bank of Norway from 2010 to 2013. Eirik's previous leadership roles at Equinor, where he's been for about 15 years now, um, include corporate strategy, corporate planning and analysis, economic analysis in upstream Norway, and energy market analysis. Prior to Equinor, he was at various positions um, in the Norwegian Ministry of Finance, Total, um, and Pottery Management Consulting. He has also served as a member of two public commissions in Norway on tax reforms. So if you would all join me in uh, welcoming Eric here. Again, please remember that we are live streaming and recording this event. So if we can welcome Eric up here to give his presentation. Good morning, and th thanks for the kind introduction. It's good to be back at Columbia. I guess that, that kind of introduction just uh, mainly proves that I'm getting old <laughs> with all that background. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present uh, our 2019 energy perspectives. This is uh, Equinor's uh, attempt at competing with the likes of uh, IEA, EIA, Shell, BP, ExxonMobil in predicting, trying to predict what the world of energy could look like over the next decades. And uh, then I hope we can have a, a good discussion. I'll focus a lot on one of our scenarios when I talk. Uh, and it's a normative scenario, uh, asking the question, what does it take to reach climate targets? Uh, but keep in mind throughout the presentation that uh, there are at least two other scenarios that uh, are there. And I'll show you those as well, of course. But, uh, but uh, and, uh, and, uh, if if you think about likelihood and where we are at the moment, at least one of the other scenarios seems more descriptive of what's going on at the moment now than a scenario that delivers on the climate targets, unfortunately. Uh, just to remind you who we are, uh, so Equinor is uh, what used to be called Statoil. It's uh, a large energy company in, uh, based in Norway uh, with activities now in uh, 35 countries, roughly. Uh, and uh, our purpose is to turn natural resources into energy. And, uh, and uh, our vision is that we want to shape the future of energy, and uh, that's what we do. The work that I'm going to present for you, um, Energy Perspectives, that's a piece of independent analytical work done in my unit and uh, across the company. Um, uh, the top leadership of our company has not read a word in the report until it's published, uh, with the exception of the CEO preface. So it is a piece of analytical, ind independent analytical work, of course, colored by the fact that uh, those of us that, that do the work work in the energy business. Uh, but it's, uh, it's decoupled uh, from our strategy, strategy prioritizations, our business development, our investment decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully, we, hopefully our work uh, gives input to the decisions 
that the company makes, but, it's, uh, but it's n I'm not going to present Equinor's strategy. When you think about where global energy might go and what that does to energy markets and energy companies and so on uh, over the next years or decades, then uh, what is clear is that there's an enormous amount of uncertainty out there that might affect developments. Uh, sustainability is not only about sustainable development goal number 13 uh, on climate change, it's about 17 sustainable development goals and we have 11 years to deliver on them. The Paris Agreement, the, those that signed the Paris Agreement in 2015 specifically pointed to the need to solve three sustainable development goals simultaneously. Number seven, affordable energy to all. Climate change, of course, number 13. And we want to solve the climate challenge also while eradicating poverty. It's written into the agreement. Uh, sustainable development goal number one. Together, that provides an even more difficult challenge than if we were only focusing on climate change. Because you can probably not eradicate poverty if we don't eradicate energy poverty, which is spread all over the world, and therefore we need more energy to be delivered, which makes the climate challenge even more difficult to solve. Uh, we all have to change if we're serious about delivering on these sustainable development goals, but none of us wants to change. So this is also, that's one of the reasons why it's difficult. Consumers have to change, industries have to change, but changing is difficult and it's costly and it's uncomfortable. We need leadership to drive this change and we lack coherent global leadership focusing on some of these ch challenges because legitimate other types of political concerns are driving decisions uh, and that also slows down the process in some of these dimensions. And what we're seeing now, I have a couple of pictures up there representing some political challenges that we have today, Brexit, the polarization, we have a trade war between India, between China and the United States, fortunately becoming slightly better, hopefully. And the LOS in Paris. The LOS in Paris is an illustration of what we now see signals of, that the polarization of global policy also now affects our ability to do climate change policies, climate policy changes. When climate policy starts to bite, you get people go to the streets, protests. Look at what happened in Ecuador some weeks back when the government announced that they would reduce fossil fuel subsidies to fix the balance in the budget in agreement with IMF. The government were forced out of the capital for a couple of days. They had to come, and then when they came back, they had to re revoke those policies. We even have protests in Norway now where a single issue anti-toll road party made a very good results, you know, very good results in the local elections. So, so polarization also reduces our ability to do something with climate policy that could actually work. And of course, under all that, we have a lot of uncertainty related to future work, competence, behavior of new generations, impact of digitalization, et cetera, et cetera, and how that can influence global energy markets. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And then where is the energy world moving? Uh, that depends what window you look out what variable or signpost you choose to assign weight to. And you get very different signals. And some signals that we see is that energy demand continues to grow, 2% last year, roughly, globally. Fossil fuel demand continues to grow. Gas, fortunately, growing faster than coal and oil. And renewable costs continue to drop. Good signal. As a consequence of fossil fuel demand growing, CO2 emissions went up again, 2%. More than in higher growth than in 2017, we had three years of flat CO2 emissions from the energy sector. Some people thought we had, it had peaked. No, a cold winter in China last year was enough to, blow, to, to have CO2 emission continue to grow. So we're, not, we're, on the, we're on the wrong path in terms of limiting, limiting CO2 emissions to sustainable levels. Uh, then we have the, these uh, multiple conflicts. China, US-China trade conflicts, one example. We have sanctions, we have Middle Eastern conflicts which we think makes it more difficult to have a coherent global movement addressing what is a very large global challenge, which is global warming. And then at the same time, some positive signals. We have more carbon being exposed to a price, much too low still, and not enough carbon, but it's growing that way. We have EV sales ramping up significantly, also in markets where it counts, like in China. Uh, so we now have five, six million EVs growing fast. Unfortunately, we have 165 million more SUVs on the roads compared to what we had in 2010. The second 
largest source of emission increase since 2010, after the power sector, is the growth in the SUV fleet. 40% of new car sales in China are SUVs. So there's still a ways to go. Unfortunately, we see record capacity additions within solar and wind. So you can paint very different pictures on where the world is going. And here's the challenge. This is what we have to solve. Global warming following from growing CO2 concentrations. But that takes place within a context that makes it extremely difficult to solve because we have a growing population, maybe two to two and a half billion more people on Earth by 2050. That leads to growing purchasing power. Growing purchasing power leads to growing demand for energy-related goods, activities, and services. Activities and services and goods that require energy either when we produce those goods and services or when we consume them or both. A lot of people are poor, don't have access to energy. Solving that requires energy. The energy asset base is growing. The things around us that either produce or use energy is growing. And all the assets have very long economic lives. How many people in the audience have a car that's older than 10 years? Quite a few. You probably have a couple of other cars as well. That means making the energy asset base more efficient takes time, and in particular when it grows. When Boeing has figured out how to fly the 737 MAX without crashing it, those planes will continue to fly probably to 2060. We might change the engines a couple of times, three times, but they will be flying. Making that fuselage much more efficient is going to be very, very difficult. The coal-fired power plant being delivered now in China or India can produce electricity for 40 years. So it's an enormously slow system to change, and it is growing, and it's enormously large. 80% fossil fuels in the mix. You wouldn't believe that when you look at all the focus on renewable electricity, but that's the truth. It was 88% in 1973, OPEC won, when the oil price quadrupled, and we banned driving on roads, uh, driving cars on the Sundays in January, February 1974 in parts of Europe because we were fr afraid of lack of oil. Some of us remember that. Since then, we have almost tripled our use of energy, and it's still 80% fossil fuels, in spite of all the revolutions that we've gone through. So it's very slow to change. And for the first time, what we have to do is we have to avoid another energy addition. We have to deliver on what is truly an energy transition if we are to address global warming. We cannot add on the renewables only to satisfy demand and continue to use oil, gas, and coal, and wood, and what humankind has always done, energy additions. We actually have to take out some sources of energy and replace with the new low carbon sources of energy. And that's never happened globally. And as I said, we have a lack of global coherent, consistent leadership that can assist in the, this transition. So that's the challenge. We have two scenarios then. Where is the world currently heading? If you look at things that, that's happening out there. We call them reform and rivalry. They're diff very different scenarios but they both build on things that we see now, policy trends, signals, et cetera, et cetera, but then they have assigned different weights to the economic climate, if you like. The reform case is, has a market and technology drive at the bottom of it, uh, uh, significant improvements in energy efficiency. We believe there that all governments will deliver on their promises in the Paris Agreement, the nationally determined contributions, so, so they will deliver upon them by 2030, and, the, and the energy and climate policies will continue to tighten. Uh, but not sufficient to deliver on, on uh, global warming. We have a geopolitical system uh, situation there, uh, sentiment that's characterized by relatively benign uh, competition and cooperation. So markets are allowed to work. We don't have a lot of sanctions, for instance. We don't have a trade war for long periods, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have a rivalry scenario where we say that it's not impossible that the current geopolitical climate will continue to color the development over the next decades, at least for long periods where we don't trust each other, where we put sanctions in place. We don't trade freely with technology, so economic growth is slower. This, the ne necessary speed of transition slows down. Much more focus on security of supply, so countries that have a lot of coal, for instance, they use more of that than they otherwise would have. Also benign, relatively benign environment for, then also for growing renewables, because that's also an indigenous resource. But as a consequence of that, we have much, more, much lower energy efficiency and higher emission intensity. So we don't d deliver on the climate targets either. Not a world that anybody would like to be in, but if you look out the window now, you can see very clear strands of that type of scenario right now. 
And then we have a normative scenario. Where does the world need to go? What has to happen if we are to deliver on well below two degree global warming or a, an energy related CO2 emission trajectory that is consistent with well below two degree warming? We call it renewable, renewal. Um, it requires immediate and coordinated policy action, we think, followed, of course, by massive adaptation, both in industries and among us as uh, consumers. And we think that it can only take place in a very benign geopolitical environment where global decision makers sit down and say that this is our biggest common challenge. We've got to do something about it, and we've got to do it now. And that's the solution to the challenge. This is a short description of that scenario, and I'll come back to all the details here. But the main point is that there's no silver bullet out here. There's not one thing that can deliver on this challenge. We need a lot of stuff, a lot of different changes. We, for instance, require tripling of the rate of energy efficiency improvement compared to what we've seen over the, next, over the last 25 years. And IEA was out with a report on Monday showing that the development there is going in the wrong direction. Energy efficiency is slowing down. We need rapid change in carbon pricing all over the place, fuel efficiency standards, et cetera, et cetera. We need massive and still partly subsidized investments in renewables, radical growth in electrification, in particular in transport, and that will depend then on deliveries of massive volumes of batteries within the next decade. We need 80% reduction in coal demand. You think that's a walk in the park? That's what we need. Half, more than half of global coal is consumed in China, by the way. We need solid growth in nuclear electricity, net of the decommissioning that we know will take place in the West. Otherwise, we need too much renewables. So we have 80% growth in nuclear compared to what, what we have today globally by 2050. Growth in biofuels. We need CCS, carbon capture and storage. And we need to finish, put into action, 1 million tons of storage capacity every week so that we get to 1.5 billion tons of total capacity annually by 2050. And we need financing mechanisms much stronger than those that are in the Paris Agreement and that were made weaker after Trump became president, and president of the United States. We need much more fi financing to, make, to facilitate this transition so that the emerging economies can afford to do the transition. And that requires global cooperation and consensus. And it should be given now that I don't think this scenario is the walk in the park. It's possible, but it's a massive challenge. So the energy world in 2050 looks very different depending on variables and scenarios. And these are some examples of the variation in outcomes across these scenarios in terms of GDP up to the left, in terms of the share of electricity produced by uh, new renewables, solar and wind, but, uh, mainly uh, in the middle. And it, it, look at that one, it grows. The share of electricity produced by intermittent renewables grows significantly and massively in all scenarios, but it grows to 50% of global electricity in the renewal case, meaning that wind turbines and solar panels by 2050 produce as much electricity in 2050 as the whole electricity generation globally today, because we double electricity demand. And half of it will be delivered by solar panels and wind turbines. If you think that's impossible, then you have to come up with another solution to drive the, to, to deliver on the climate targets. Oil and gas demand. Gas demand up to the, to, the, uh, to the right, either down 20% by 2050 in the renewal scenario or up 20% in the other two scenarios. But the, we don't go out of gas. We still need a lot of gas by 2050. Down to the right, that's the oil demand forecast across scenarios, a massive difference, 100% variation. When my boss saw that forecast, I mean, he, he's the boss of a company producing a lot of oil. He, he wants to know what oil demand is in 2050. When you saw that forecast, it's either 50 million barrels per day in a renewal case, not zero, 50, or 120 in a robbery case. He said that he's reminded of the story of Harry S. Truman. When he became president of the United States, he asked for a one-armed chief economic advisor because he was so tired of economists saying on the one hand and on the other. But as a, this is a really bad forecast from a chief economist in an energy company, right? But that's, it, it illustrates the uncertainty. And a massive decline in oil demand is needed if we are to deliver on climate targets. And look at the variation in EV penetration in the middle there. How many electric vehicles do we have on the ground in these different scenarios? Up to 1.3 billion. And it goes to 90 to 100% of the fleet. Everything has to be electrified in terms of light duty vehicle uh, uh, fleet. And then the CO2 emission trajectory. And I'll come back to that. But the green line there is what is necessary if you 
listen to IPCC and, uh, and uh, IEA and others, and what is, what is needed to deliver on a 1.7, 1.8 degree warming. That's the trajectory. So uh, just a reminder that uh, the sustainable energy transition is, much, is part of a larger sustainability picture. And one of the key challenges is that global population is increasing. We have more than a billion or close to a billion people that do not have access to electricity already. And then we're going to have electricity needed for two and a half billion more going forward. We have billions of people that, are, uh, that only have unsustainable biomass and other sources of energy for their cooking and heating. That also has to be solved. And of course, the more people drives more economic growth, purchasing power. So we have to put this into the perspective of not only addressing one of these sustainable development dimensions, but several. And fortunately, a lot of the sustainable development goals can be achieved faster, probably, by delivering on reduced emissions as well and reduced pollution. But it does require energy. Just think about one of the goals here is gender equality, meaning increased opportunities for women in the workforce in many countries of the world where that is still possible. What does that do to demand for work-related travel? What does it do to purchasing power and demand for energy? That's an example. So delivering on that goal will need more of goal number seven, affordable energy for all. That's an example. And traditionally, we see these links between energy demand per capita growing with wealth, right? Higher income levels, you, you, we use more energy per capita. The United States is a clear example. Norway, where I come from, another one. So moving some of the large countries among the emerging economies to higher per capita GDP level has a tendency of requiring more energy. And when you take into account that there's, by 2050, going to be 1.3 billion Chinese and 1.6 billion Indians, who will have a per capita GDP, goal, sig per GDP level significantly higher than they have today. Not at the levels we have in, 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 in the, in the north, northeast corner of that uh, chart, but still, you can see the underlying challenge in terms of final energy demand. So where are the markets moving today? If, if we buy today, then say, on the rivalry or reform path. So world energy demand grows, grows much less than GDP, but still grows by 20% or 30% to the left there, primary energy demand. And you can see that both those scenarios contain what I call an energy addition. We don't take out the fossil fuels. They're constant or increasing. That's the dark part of those columns. And then most new energy is renewable or some nuclear. But it's not an energy transition. And you see that in particular in the electricity sector where we double electricity generation. So electricity will be a more important part of our final energy consumption. Almost all that electricity, new electricity, will be delivered either by nuclear or new renewables, but we don't get coal and gas out of the mix. And therefore, CO2 emissions peak, but at much too high levels and don't come down, which they have to. So what does it look like in a reform case? Much more improvement in energy efficiency so that we think it's possible to deliver all the energy the world needs with lower total primary energy demand in 2050 than today by tripling the rate of energy efficiency and moving to electricity away from inefficient biomass and inefficient fossil fuels. That's never happened, by the way. It has to happen globally. It does happen in some countries, sometimes, but now it has to happen globally over the next 30 years. Doubling the size of the economy using less primary energy demand. And a true energy transition, both in primary energy demand, taking out fossil fuels, but in electricity, producing twice as much electricity, and we're using much less coal and gas in that electricity mix. 80% more nuclear and massive growth in new renewables. That's what it takes. Then we're on that path by design, not because it's easy, but it's possible. But something has to change relatively quickly or very quickly. So these are the energy intensity developments. The bottom line there is falling three times as fast as it has done globally historically. So that's how much energy do we use per unit of GDP. Uh, that has to, uh, the rate of improvement has to triple, and we're going in the wrong direction at the moment. And another key to, the, to this, to deliver, be able to deliver on the energy transition and the, and the climate targets is electrification. So we have to increase the share of, of our final energy consumption, that is electricity, much more rapidly than what we've done historically. Today, 20% of our final energy is electricity. 
it has to double, it still means that 60% of final energy demand in 2050 are molecules and not electrons. We don't have to electrify completely, but we have to become much more electric and combined with new renewables or low carbon sources of electricity. So these are some of the other variables in the renewal scenario that has to change. 80% reduction, reduction in coal demand, and since more than half of that coal is already used in China, and a third of the rest is used in India, that's where most of the reduction will have to take place. These are countries that have coal as indigenous resources and do not have enough gas to replace it with. So that's another part of this. That we have to facilitate the change whereby they, these countries uh, find it acceptable to not use their own source of energy and develop their own sources of renewables, but at the same time also import gas to replace it, at least for a period. Otherwise, it won't happen. Massive growth in wind capacity, solar panels capacity to produce half of global electricity in that middle. And then you have the one million tons of CCS in operation per week. Every week from now to 2050 in order to reach one and a half billion tons. If you look at some of the other scenarios that deliver on climate targets, like the IEA sustainable development scenario or the Shell Sky, both those scenarios have much more carbon capture and storage by 2050 than we do. Sky, Shell Sky has 50, 5 billion tons. We have one and a half. Most of the IPCC one and a half degree scenarios, most of them have massive amounts of carbon capture and storage. The flip side of that is, of course, that in a sense, they are, they are not um, aggressive enough or courageous enough on energy efficiency, the ability to take coal out of the mix, the ability to reduce oil demand or gas demand. And then as a consequence, you need more carbon capture and storage to deliver the same, on the same type of carbon budget. That's how we, so we are so aggressive, if you like, in some of the other assumptions that we do not need more than one and a half billion tons, but it's still massive. It's a one million ton facility every week. So this is what the electricity sector develops according to, uh, or the lines. The electricity demand in all scenarios, we've already seen it, it doubles. Note that we get a new source of electricity, visible uh, electricity demand there. That's from the transport sector. There's a new chunk in that column, the dark maroon there, which is the electricity demand from the transport sector. Electrification of light duty vehicles mainly, but also buses and trucks. Then we have the, what the sources of change in generation. It's the same across all scenarios. We think new renewables will be the main source of growth in electricity generation capacity, irrespective of scenario. Massive opportunities for companies like ours and others to go in there and make those investments if we can get the regulatory mechanisms right. But the difference is that in the renewal case, in the middle one, that growth will have to be even higher because we have to take out fossil fuel capacity in coal. So we will hardly produce electricity from coal in that scenario. That's the big difference. So we, we need much more growth because we're going to phase out capacity. And then to the right, you can see what the electricity mix looks like. And in the renewal case, half of global electricity will then be produced by uncontrollable intermittent renewable sources where we need grids, storage, and a market design that actually makes that work. This is road transport. Massive changes there as well. Light LDVs, that's the light duty vehicles. We are very optimistic relative to many other scenarios on penetration of, in particular, battery driven electric vehicles. And we have to be, we think, and in particular in the renewal case, which is a normative scenario, we see that that's one way of delivering massive reductions in oil demand. It's electrification of light duty vehicles. It doesn't happen now far from quickly enough, with the exception of uh, Norway and, and, and a couple of other places. And we, do, we, we have it because we massively subsidize the change. A Tesla in, in, uh, in Norway costs half of what Tesla likes to call an equivalent BMW, which it's not an equivalent car, but still. Here it costs roughly the same, right? And that's because it's massively subsidized, and as a consequence, almost half of all new cars in Norway are now electricity driven. Globally, we have to go to half by 2030, so that by 2050, the fleet is more or less fully electrified. All light duty vehicles, everything that weighs less than three and a half tons. In the middle, you can see the fuel mix changes and the fleet changes for trucks. Much more efficient logistics is one of the key para parameters in, in a renewal scenario, so we need, we need fewer trucks, if you like. Electricity there as well, but still oil and gas, hybrids. Buses is the same, I don't show that here, but we have a lot of electric buses. And then we have the rest of transport, non-road transport, 
shipping, railroad, public transportation systems, aircraft. Now look at the changes there. We think we have to, and we think it's possible, that we can fly two and a half to three times as many passenger miles with aircraft in 2050 and do that using less liquids than today. Less oil, slightly more biofuels. Much more efficient planes. Not much electricity at the global scale, probably a little bit of electric planes in short, short haul in Norway, for instance, but much more gas in shipping. All railroads in the world will have to be electrified, but still there will be a remaining oil demand in that sector. This is when a lot of, when they've come to this point in the presentation, this is when many people stop talking about the energy transition. We're done with electricity, that's decarbonized, and we have electrified large parts of transport, home free. No. That's not true, you all know that. And the other sectors, the other sources of energy use, the transition there is more difficult than in electricity in particular, but also in transport. What is that? It's what IEA calls industrial demand. That's manufacturing. That's all the energy use in all factories producing all the stuff that we need, for instance, the Tesla, or the chairs you're sitting on. That will be more efficient, it will be more electrified, but we will still use some molecules there for heat processes where, where it's difficult to replace it, we think. But it has to become much more green, much more efficient in a renewal case. Look at the other scenarios, there's also much more electricity there. In the middle, all the energy use in buildings. To 2050, we might build a billion new homes for the two and a half billion new people. A new source of visible global growth in electricity demand is air conditioning in India. So new homes in hot places on Earth will require energy. We think it's possible to do that, and then you have all the office buildings for these two and a half billion people as well. We think it's possible to deliver all that energy much more, with much more electricity and with less total final energy consumption than today. But it's a massive, it's a much larger fleet of houses, if you stock of houses, buildings. And then to the right, we have what the IEA calls non-energy demand, that's feedstock. That's oil and gas used to produce roughly everything, petrochemical production. That will continue to grow, that demand, we think. It does contain the carbon, it doesn't emit the CO2 until it's burnt way down the road. We think we will recycle much more plastic in that renewal scenario, but the demand will still grow. Not, the, not in line with GDP growth, but it will grow. And it, when I do this for young students in Norway, high school students, I, I ask them, have you tried to live a day without hydrocarbons? Has anybody done that, tried to do that here? Occasionally somebody says yes, and then the, the next question for me is, uh, me, so that means you, when you got up this morning, you didn't brush your teeth. Because once you start a day, you start using hydrocarbons, both the toothpaste and the toothbrush, the makeup that uh, all women and all young men use, uh, our clothes, our kitchens, our car. There's no car in the garage if you don't have hydrocarbons. There's no tarmac or asphalt to walk on. You have to walk without shoes to an office building that doesn't exist. There are no seats there. There are no... No, no, except in Iran and Azerbaijan, there are no wall-to-wall -wall carpets either because they're made of hydrocarbons as well. So that's that part. That will continue to grow. And by the end of 2050, in the renewal case, that will be almost 40% of remaining oil demand. So we take out a lot of the oil, the burning parts of the oil, but we think we have a growing component. So this is this very bad forecast for oil demand from 50 to 120 million barrels, roughly, by 2050. And where does the decline in the renewal case, the light green line, where does that come from across sectors? You see that to the right. Most of the reduction is, of course, in the transport sector, because transport uses more than half of global oil. 55 million of the 100 million barrels per day that we use are used in transport. It's not 100, but it's 55. And the massive reduction has to come in that sector. But we have reduction in oil demand across all other sectors as well. Power, there's just a remaining, and there's not, no power produced by oil in 2050 in the renewal case, but there is some today, so you take that out. In the residential commercial sectors, heating and cooling, et cetera, et cetera. But we use slightly more oil, as I said, for feedstock. 
That's the growth component, the green one there. And then you end up at 52 million barrels per day. Gas demand, better forecast, but in terms of less variation at least, probably maybe worse in terms of hitting what it ends up at. Plus minus 20%. Reduction in 20% towards the end of the period. What is uh, in the renewal case? If you look at that line, you see that it continues to increase for quite a while. The re main reason for that is that given the tight carbon budget that we have in a renewal scenario, and it becomes tighter and tighter the more years that we miss it, right? Then we use the carbon budget. The need to replace coal in the power sector is now so urgent in order for us to reach that, do you, we be, stay within that budget, that we need rapid phase out of coal-fired electricity in many countries. And renewables are not ready yet to take over. That means we will have growing gas demand for a period in power sectors around the world until renewables and nuclear are sufficiently large to make it possible to take out gas. And then we have to take out gas because that's also within the carbon budget, right? So that's why it falls so rapidly towards the end. That, is difficult to foresee how that market will operate. Who will invest in a, a gas-fired electricity plant if he or she knows that it, by 2035 uh, you can only use it for 400 hours a year as backup? So it, whether, how that market will work is uncertain. You can see that gas demand in this scenario falls in all regions around the world when you aggregate them, with the exception of some emerging economies and particular examples, China and India there, massive growth in China relative to today, it's almost a new Europe in terms of gas demand growth in China. And we don't think they can satisfy that demand by their own gas, so there will be growth in LNG in that scenario as well. So with that, what's the need for new oil and gas investment? Is there any need for new oil and gas investment? Should we just uh, shut down all energy companies around the world since we have enough resources already? This is the demand range for oil and gas in the scenarios. The bottom part of that range is the renewal case on our way to a 1.7, 1.8 degree warming world by 2100. If we fired every geologist, geophysicist, reservoir engineer, most of our drilling people with a few exceptions, and then we probably, they would probably fire most of us economists as well, in the global oil and gas industry, and we only kept production at existing fields. So we maintained installations. We drilled a few wells to keep production going. Global supply will fall every year by 3 to 6 percent. Roughly 4.5 percent is what I put in here. Because hydrocarbon reservoirs has the characteristics that once, you, once you, they give away one molecule, one hydrocarbon molecule, it becomes less willing to give away the next one. The pressure pulls. We've got to work on these things. We've got to invest. We have a lot of resources, but we have to put platforms on top of them to make them produce oil. So existing supply would then fall by 4.5% per year. Something that falls by 4.5% per year for 30 years ends up at 25% of where it started, meaning that supply from existing fields in terms of oil is at roughly 25 million barrels in 2050. And demand is more than 50 in the renewal case. And if you think the other scenarios are possible, then the challenge is even bigger. And the same for gas over there. That means we need to fill that white gap, at least, with new stuff. Things that do not deliver today. New fields. As an example, we have a discovery called Ben and Nord in, in Canada, just outside Newfoundland. That's a resource. It's there. But we haven't made the investment yet. Same thing with an LNG plant we have a discovery we have in Tanzania. ExxonMobil has just made massive discoveries in Guyana, but they haven't put the capital in place there. There's a resource, but it hasn't made it into a reserve. That will have to happen in order to fill that gap. Massive investments. And it, what, how much is it? 300 billion barrels of oil has to be delivered from something that doesn't deliver today, over the next 30 years. None of us has a very intimate relationship to a billion barrel of oil. So how much is 300 billion barrels? Well, as an example, it's as much oil as OPEC in total has delivered the last 30 years. So we need as much oil coming from something new the next 30 years to satisfy demand in a climate consistent, climate target consistent world. And if you think the demand could be higher, we need more. 
62 trillion cubic meters of gas, 62,000 billion cubic meters of gas is also new, and that's more gas than the accumulated deliveries of the United States, Russia, and all of the Middle East over the last 30 years. So we can't shut down oil and gas activities. Massive investments are needed. In addition, we all look at the need for growth in renewable electricity. Here we just, I just give some examples on what we have as capacity additions in, in wind and solar in the different scenarios. And that continues to grow, not by the same exponential growth rate all the time, but it grows in absolute numbers in the renewable case all the way up to almost 2050. And one aspect of that is that when it gets older, larger, an increasing challenge will be that we have to invest in new turbines and solar panels because the old ones become obsolete. So the dark part there is investments needed just to avoid capacity from falling. Because these turbines don't live forever, and the solar panels neither. So we have to do that. And then we have to make sure that in order to electrify transport, here we only go to 2030, and it's mainly batteries needed for the electrification of the car fleet and the bus fleet and truck fleet to the right. And you can see how much batteries we need by 2030, the capacity, gigawatt hour capacity delivered in 10 years. And then it has to continue to grow. And we haven't done anything with the power sector by then yet, but we might need batteries there as well. And you can see how much batteries were delivered last year and what the battery producers have announced they will deliver by 2023. This is a massive growth needed in a capital intensive industry starting with mining then transporting stuff out of mines, then refining, then making the batteries and putting it into the cars. That also has to happen. Enormous opportunities for those that think they can take out these minerals, those that can build these batteries, but also it has to happen and it has to be financed. And it's a capital intensive industry. So in summary, we think that uh, Deliver, it's possible to deliver on a sustainable transition, but it is a massive challenge. And a lot of good things have to come together for that to happen sufficiently quickly. And the global demand for energy dependent goods, services, and activities will continue to grow. We think a concerted global political action is a key, whereby industries also assist and follow and get the right incentives. And all us consumers will just have to prepare for the change as well. And whether we reach these uh, targets or achieve them or at least come close to them is not determined in Brussels, Berlin, or Baltimore, but in Beijing and Bangalore. Merging economies are the key here. Thank you. So just a quick polling of the room. How many people have been to one of our events before? Okay, you all have me beat. Um, this is my first one in person since I joined the center. So um, hopefully I can follow all my instructions well and you can tell me after uh, where, I, where I missed a step. But very quickly, right now we're gonna do a moderated discussion. We've got something like 45 minutes left. Um, so I don't wanna take all that time because we wanna hear from you and what your questions are. Um, but first, Eric and I are going to just chat through some of the aspects of the report that he maybe didn't get to um, and just tease out a couple of the things he did mention briefly, but maybe we didn't get into it to the depth that we might want to. Uh, one thing that I'll remind everyone, again, we're being live cast, um, and if you have any questions, you can get on Twitter and use the hashtag CJEPEvents and our Twitter handle at ColumbiaUEnergy to ask a question, and Caitlin and Megan uh, will help us to see those coming through. So uh, when we do get to the Q&A uh, session of this with y'all, uh, Megan has a, if you can wave in the back, she has a microphone and she will come to you. And this will mean you do not have to yell and you do not have to worry about if we can hear you or understand. It also allows people online to hear what you're asking. So um, thank you in advance, Megan, for all of that and for running around. All right, so I wanna step back um, to what my colleague John Elkind likes to say, that 50,000 foot view. When you're setting up these outlooks, these future of energy reports, you can't do everything. Um, you simply don't have the resources for that. We never can. And you've picked three kind of main scenarios to go down. And 
you outlined why this low carbon sustainable development feature um, was important to do, but I'm wondering why that set of three? Why did you pick those three? Where did the geopolitical risk kind of scenario, why was that important for you to do again? You know, why, why were these the three that you put in the report and not an endless number of other ones you could have done? Well, I, I think uh, when, you, when you do these uh, exercises and, and you, tell, you try to tell stories about the future, which these scenarios are, you, I mean, you, a point of the story is to have significantly different scenarios. So you, mm -hmm. have, to, you have to find variables that, that describe those scenarios uh, sufficiently differently so that you, it makes sense to have an outcome, which is, uh, and it may, it's credible to have an outcome that is very different. Um, the underlying growth in, and the underlying change in some of the technologies that mm. we see out there could have been a source of that as well. Mm -hmm. but, but they are massive in all the scenarios anyway. So it's, uh, and, it's, and, and I think also, uh, at least what we have consciously done is to try and look at some of the, some of the key aspects of um, the combination of technology development and economic development and incentives needed for mm. the system to change. And that means uh, things like you, you need to you, uh, things like uh, carbon pricing, things like uh, fuel efficiency standards, uh, where we make it possible also for the energy consumer to change behavior. Mm -hmm. And what is it that drive those? And, and under what conditions could the outcome for those types of variables be very different? And that leads to at least to the difference between a rivalry scenario and a renewal scenario. And when we made the rivalry scenario the first time, uh, I mean, it was also par partly colored by things we saw then. Uh, and that was just after the euphoria of, uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals Agreement in 2015, the Paris Agreement. Uh, but then we saw the increasing tendencies of, of politics actually moving in the wrong direction. Polit politicians are extremely good at talking about targets mm -hmm. and generally extremely bad at establishing measures that would move us in, in the direction of those targets. And that we saw that in, in, the, in the spring of 2015 when we started to make these, uh, spring of 2016 when we made these scenarios. So, so, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a combination of finding, and then of course, other people make other scenarios and we needed ours, right? So, <laughs> so uh, and we're, I, I think we're the only one that has uh, something like that rivalry scenario. It's, it's coming now in the, in the political science literature about this. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, uh, but having modeled that kind of scenario and, and explaining it by geopolitical conflict is uh, something you don't find in in other institution scenarios. So I'm wondering with these scenarios and with this report, as you said, there's a number of organizations that look at the energy future and they look at it with different lenses. Um, should I be encouraged? Should we be encouraged by what we're seeing in this report? Um, you have some more aggressive and optimistic views when it comes to energy efficiency and how we'll be able to uptake mm -hmm. that, et cetera. Or should I be discouraged because, you know, again, you're saying we need we're already going through massive technological change and we need even more mm. and we need regulation and markets that will support all of that and we're clearly not on that path yet. So should I be smiling or frowning at this moment? Well, I, no, I, th I think first of all, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good reasons to be optimistic. A lot of things are happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also important not to despair even if we do not reach what we think is an extremely precise target for achieving an extremely precise temperature consequence in 2100. Uh, ev everything we can do to move us in the right direction in terms of energy efficiency, uh, in terms of getting out of pollution, mm -hmm. in terms of, of driving down the carbon emissions of energy use, ev any, everything we do and can do will help. Uh, and we should stop spending too much time discussing the finer details of whether it's one and a half or 1.7 or two or two and a half. Uh, if, if the alternative is that the world moves in, in, in the direction of a three and a half degree warming, everything we can do should be done. Mm. And we should start now. And, if, and, and we might actually be very good at it. Once we start, we might get, get the hang of it and, and the development might go faster than, than uh, if you're pessimistic, you believe now. So, so I think, yeah, but of course, it's an enormous challenge, but, but it's also that, that uh, as I said, this, I mean, a sustainable development uh, is dependent on, not, on, on a number of variables and sustainable development goals, and, and uh, we cannot focus on only one. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to look at this in a broad, broad way. There are, there are good reasons why energy demand goes up in India these days, and that has to do with sustainability in many other dimensions than climate change. 
I mean, speaking about those variables, one thing that we were chatting about earlier that struck me in the report was the GDP projections in mm. these different scenarios. And um, when I was reading through it, uh, one conversation I often have with other folks is, well, if we do this green transition, if we do the sustainable transition, we have to compromise global GDP growth. But in your scenario, while it's slower in the beginning, that low carbon future is actually the highest GDP growth of them all overall. Is this correct, my understanding? And can you explain why that's what you have in your GDP projections? Because those are very key, as, as we know, to what your future energy demand is going to look like, everything. Yeah. Well, that's true. That's, uh, uh, we end up at a higher GDP level in a renewal scenario than the other. So the average growth rate is slightly higher than in the, than in the reform case. Um, but, it's, but it's lower in the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. The transition period here will cost us something. We think uh, we're going to dismantle and take out the perfectly functioning energy producing equipment uh, with, that has low costs, uh, replace that with something which we don't know how will work. We will do we basically have double investments for a period. So that will slow down global GDP growth for a period. But gradually, we think that taking out fossil fuel subsidies, uh, having a market correct uh, incentive mechanisms, uh, a CO2 price that reflect the true societal cost of what we're doing, uh, more efficiently working markets, uh, that will improve growth in the rural case relative to the two others. Mm -hmm. uh, and then towards the, towards the end of the period, so we just, we're not, I mean, it's very difficult to do that, but what we've done is that towards the end of the period, we also pull down GDP growth, both in the reform and in particular in the robbery scenario, due to increasing consequences of pollution, and, and, uh, and increasing global warming. Mm -hmm. so that you, and that has a societal cost as well, right? And more so in those scenarios where we don't reach those targets. So, so you get a drag on GDP growth in the two other scenarios. That's why we end up where we are. Um, that being said, future global GDP growth is an extremely uncertain parameter as well. Uh, population part of that is not very uncertain for in the next decades. Uh, but the consequence of higher education on the quality of labor, if you like, is mm -hmm. uncertain. Uh, the efficiency of capital, all the capital investments that we're going to put in together with labor to drive economic growth is uncertain. Uh, and uh, not to mention the future productivity development, uh, the way we combine labor and capital and how, how efficiently can we become. So, and there are some signals that, that uh, GDP growth is, is uh, on its way down, in particular because productivity development is slow. Uh, but uh, and that could affect some of these. We're not very optimistic on GDP relative to others. GDP growth here, but uh, and as an example to illustrate uh, what GDP growth here could mean, in the case of India, as an example, that's a it's a m massive country. Uh, it uses very little energy. It's a poor country per capita energy use very low. It has a lot of biomass in, in the energy mix. That's one of the reasons why New Delhi is much more polluted than Beijing. But it doesn't emit a lot of CO2. In the Indian case, economic growth might lead that economy to, and population growth might lead that economy to be seven times as large by 2050 as today in economic terms. Um, it will have 300 million more people. It will be more hev much more heavily populated, uh, densely populated than the Netherlands by 2050. Mm -hmm. And their CO2 emissions have to go down mm -hmm. in our scenario from now to 2050 by roughly 30%. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge. How can we allow India a sustainable development, as an example, and uh, they will do a lot of this themselves, but it's, uh, can we transform that economy and that energy to, to that combination of higher GDP, higher use of energy, more people using energy, electrifying 300 million people who don't have electricity today, and reduce their emissions? That's what it takes. And my understanding is, Ecuador, you now have offices in New Delhi, yeah? You've opened up. Yeah. And I wonder how that decision was made that now, you know, why are you there? Why did you make that decision? Is it really because of this massive increase in energy demand? Do you see a strategic advantage about what Ecuador could provide that others could not? Um, well, I, that's, the latter part is difficult to pinpoint. I mean, it's already a big market for us when we sell products in India. Uh, we think it, uh, what, some of the things that we might bring in there in terms of offshore wind and renewables is, a, is an option that we would, would like to explore, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're there. Uh, uh, but it's also, and potentially there could be a, could be a, a larger market for gas as mm -hmm. well. So, so that's, uh, but it's also, it's, it's a vibrant economy. It's an enormously large economy. We, if we had been a, an older and larger company, we probably would have been in India <laughs> many years ago. So it's also, we are ready to, to, 
to have resources put into those countries as well. And you mentioned that the offshore web angle of things. I mean, Equinor, you've got kind of a foot in what is currently arguably two different worlds, where you have oil and gas, of course, a major part of the business, and then you also have offshore wind, and you've got mm -hmm. the UK developments, the new ones have been announced, and then here in New York, et cetera. Does it feel like a relationship full of tension, or is this seamlessly integrated within the company? I mean, how, how does it feel to be part of both of these worlds, and do you think that you can expand that renewable electricity side of the company? Where do you see the company developing on that side of things? No, what we've said is that uh, we aim to, if we are successful, we, we will have 15 to 20 percent of our total investments uh, within what we call new energy solutions uh, within the next decade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and with the new you know, offshore wind facilities that we will build here and, and in the UK, we're on our way to do that, uh, mm -hmm. to grow that part of the business. Uh, but it has to be done profitably. Uh, it will not only be renewable electricity, but it can also be low carbon solutions like carbon capture and storage and, and, uh, and uh, different kinds of decarbonization as well. But, but uh, for now, it's the renewable electricity that is growing. Um, what we see is, that, of course, it, it has a lot in common. Uh, uncertainty about future pricing is, is, is an example. Uh, we, uh, with offshore, with the size of these wind turbines, the size of the, of the projects now, the, the one that we're going to build in the UK where we just won the auction is roughly $10 billion mm -hmm. in terms of investments. So the size of these projects now resemble large oil and gas facilities. Uh, we know how to move stuff and operate and maintain it in 10, uh, 10 meter, 30 feet uh, waves in the North Sea, mm -hmm. and that's what is required also. For, so we, we have some competences here where, which are completely parallel. So our technolo uh, technology experience, that's one of the reasons why we're bigger in offshore wind than in solar, as an example, at least yet. So there are many common things, and then of course it's, it's new, but, uh, but the future, o uh, future oil and gas will also be very different than, than old oil and gas. And just, uh, just imagine how different shale oil and shale gas is compared to very large investments on an offshore gas field that delivers gas for 40 years, mm -hmm. 50 years. So, so the oil and gas industry is also going through transitions. The use of technology is, is changing, and, it's, uh, and it can be applicable in different parts of the energy spectrum as well. So one of the things I noticed with the last year's report, so the 2018 report, is that you called it a, or people called it a call to action. Mm -hmm. And is, that, is it the same for 2019? Is it the same for this report? Is this a call to action to say we need to do something different yeah. aggressively? And it's even more urgent. Okay. Because we have used one more year to eat out of the carbon budget, and nothing is happening. So, so, it's, uh, so in that sense, if we're, if, if, if we're serious about reducing energy-related CO2 emissions within a given time period, then the urgency is increasing every year. So, uh, so, uh, and then, of course, uh, we also see some positive signals that become stronger and stronger, but the speed at which it develops is, is, uh, is uh, not sufficiently high. And one example now was, uh, was uh, that the, uh, the most recent data for, from IEA on Monday, energy efficiency is actually slowing down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of, and one of the examples of why it is difficult to get things more energy efficient was uh, some data indicating that, that as uh, wealth and income levels increase, the, the average size of homes go up. Mm -hmm. So the flo average floor space in an apartment in a given city uh, goes up. I think it was a 30% increase in India over the next last 10 years. So, so as wealth increases, you have more stuff, you buy larger houses, which means you require more cooling or more heating, and that, that, then that makes it more difficult to become more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. And so these rebound effects and, and the income elasticity effect, the comfort factor as we become richer, is also something that limits our ability to, to use less energy per unit of GDP. Mm -hmm. I mean, within this, this report and this call to action, I wonder if you can speak a little bit more to how these projections play into Equinor's strategy. Uh, you said that the head of the company is the only one who saw it before you published, I think is what you said. Only um, his own preface. Okay, so <laughs> how does this go into the strategy, which my next question is a spoiler, is going to be about timelines, um, mm -hmm. because there seems to be quite a bunch of tension between the timeline of this. We're talking about 2050, though, with a lot of near-term action. In your company, you know, when you're developing a new project, maybe you're talking about 10 years of headway to get a project mm -hmm. online, and then you're talking about quarterly returns. Um, these are a lot of timelines and a lot of tension between them, I see. Is this yeah. what you see? And how does this report play into all of those timelines and all of the strategies within each one of them? 
Yeah, no, no I th I, well, I, I guess the, uh, the advantage from, if you see this from, from the corporate, uh, corporate executive committee's point of view, the advantage that this is an independent piece of work is that they are also then completely at liberty to, to read other people's reports and look at other scenarios and use other types of input uh, when they uh, make their investment decisions and, and strategic priorities. Um, and, and the good thing for us is that we, we are, we are allowed to, to do analysis that, uh, that doesn't reflect on our priorities, right? But, but the way we use these scenarios and other scenarios in our discussions on strategy and investment decisions is, of course, that it's, it's used as a, uh, as a backdrop for testing robustness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, we hope it improves the quality of the discussions within, uh, within the, uh, the corporate decision, uh, making bodies, uh, types of what-if analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, what if questions, what happens, I mean, I if you believe there is a slight probability of the renewal scenario, what you could foresee is a massive change in, in uh, energy and climate policies relatively rapidly that could shift the relative profitability of some, of, some, some opportunities, right? CO2 pricing going up, meaning that, uh, meaning that uh, you shift the profitability to be between different types of, of, uh, of uh, ga different types of gas extraction mm -hmm. technologies, for instance, relatively quickly. So that means that, uh, that we have to think about that when we, sort of, when we make investment decisions, uh, robustness criteria, break-even type of prices, uh, requiring that these projects shall fly even if, we, so they, even if we were to have, they should be good projects in all scenarios, ideally, right? Mm -hmm. um, also, not, not being blind uh, to sort of the, the, the extreme uh, outcomes of these scenarios. Uh, for instance, uh, don't think that renewable investments are smart only in the renewal case. Because there ma there's massive growth in renewables in the rivalry case as well. So, so for any given company, uh, renewables is an interesting place to, to potentially be, in all, irrespective of outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, the type of discussions we have also is that these are three lines, and there's absolutely no chance that the development will be as smooth as in this, right? Neither policy-wise nor actually in, in terms of demand. So, so be prepared for the possibility of abrupt changes as well, where you could move from a rivalry trajectory towards a renewal trajectory relatively quickly, much more noisy, much more cost, costly, if you like. So prepare for that as well. And for those of you who haven't seen the report, um, which is available online, I yeah. you can download it, uh, you have your black swans, kind of what are we going to explore? I don't think you, you go to Mars this, that this last time. Last year we went yeah. to Mars. Yeah. Which is pretty great. Um, but also talking about these on the three pathways, I appreciate the comments that you had in there about how it's very unlikely that we're going to follow one of these pathways exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it's about what we can tell between the pathways. And each one of these pathways is extremely sensitive to all the things we've talked about so far. Yeah. Um, one thing that you touched on in terms of assumptions within these pathways is around CCS. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to speak about that for a minute. Should we be surprised that an organization that has successfully used CCS um, is not much more bullish about it and pushing it in there to as high as technically we could, in our wildest dreams, push that in there? I mean, why, why is it so low? Yeah, why in a sense, yeah, why, why it is so low and still so massive. Mm. Uh, yeah, in a sense, I mean, you would think that um, with our experience in CCS and, uh, and we've done this, uh, at least the, sort of the, the, the pre-combustion type of, of capturing for the better part of 30 years now, uh, we see, I mean, we see that, that it can work. But, uh, but what we also see is that uh, in the parts of, parts of the energy spectrum where it's really necessary, where it's uh, post-combustion, either in power sector or in, or in some manufacturing, the development is extremely slow. Um, the carbon pricing basically is too low to make that happen. That's a big, any, any, with the exception of the, and then of course we, we might figure out ways to use carbon dioxide in sort of in, in, a, in a profitable way, but, but with, without that, then the only source of income, if you like, for a CCS project is the avoidance of a future carbon tax, carbon price. And with the carbon price being so low, there is no incentive to capture, transport, or store. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we, don't, we think when we see the development now in, in uh, renewable electricity, we, uh, we, we see that that's a more likely development path mm -hmm. for decarbonizing the power sector, which means we don't need as much carbon capture and storage in, by 2050 to reach carbon targets. Mm -hmm. But if we had been less bullish on renewables, like some of our competitors are, mm -hmm. uh, or, or more bullish on the need for electricity, 
some, some of our competitors have much more electricity in by 2040, then you need more coal-fired electricity, and as a consequence, you have to have much more carbon capture and storage. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a weighing of these, and none of us are right. But we should get started. In order to get to one and a half billion tons by 2050, we, we better start now. So along this electrification comment that you made, I wrote down what you said so that I, I don't misquote you. Um, so we look at renewables being this massive part of, I mean, renewables expanding massively in any of these scenarios, but a massive part of this, um, the, the low carbon scenario, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, you said that it's vital that we get regulatory mechanisms right. And um, just as a, a flagging it for uh, Cheryl, who's joined us, um, we have someone who's worked right in the middle of regulation and electricity in the United States, Cheryl LaFleur, who was a FERC commissioner for the past nine years, just recently left. Um, I'm wondering if we could, Megan, could we get a microphone up to Cheryl, because I'd love to have your thoughts on this here in a minute, but I'll start with Eric while we're doing that. Um, what are the right mechanisms? How, well, do we, how do we get it right? Yeah, so, uh, we don't really know, right? And, and, it's a, and, and I, I think we are, we're also maybe, um, we, will, we will see a very rapid development in renewable electricity I think, uh, over the next decades, decade at least, um, driven by the fact that we still then have a lot of um, fossil fuel-based or other sources of electricity in the system so that you can, you can be reasonably sure if you, if you put in place an offshore wind uh, facility, uh, you can be reasonably sure that most of the time there's another source of electricity that helps you get a price any given hour. Mm -hmm a gas-fired facility or something else, hydro or whatever. But once you get to, to 25, 30 percent of your electricity mix being non-controllable intermittent renewables, you will experience times of the day or times of the year where there is no electricity price because the, the only source of electricity is a zero marginal cost source of electricity. And, and then you either get shut-ins like you have in California or you get negative electricity prices uh, like you have in Germany. You've got to pay 140 hours last year. You had to pay to get rid of electricity in Germany. So, so the future regulatory aspect of, of how, how do we make sure that we have a price that is sufficiently high to have somebody believe that it's going to be sufficiently high to cover my fixed costs. And, and that becomes more of a problem when you have, uh, also you have uh, correlations between when, when, when do you produce most wind and so sun that's in the middle of the day. When do you use most electricity? It's not in the middle of the day. So, so and, that, and then about batteries as well. So, so, so that and that is, is it capacity payments? Is it, uh, is it a guarantee? What, what is it? It's, it's a regulatory problem where, where there's a role for government mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, no government has yet experimented with that type of electricity market. Mm -hmm. so, it's, uh, so we're working on what, what do you think could be different archetypes in future market design that would make it more or less interesting for us to go into different markets. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course you have to speculate about the future politicians' ability to put that in place, right? And I think you and, have people on yeah. your team who who look at these things. Yes, yeah. yes, we have, so, mm -hmm. and it's necessary to, to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sheldon. Well, I, <coughs> excuse me. I think we're definitely going to continue to see large growth and in investment in wind and solar. Besides the concern about climate that's driving that. You know, we've seen the price of solar come down 85 percent in the last decade and wind come down in half, and those cost curves are still going down. So that's going to be a lot of new investment. But I agree with Eric that it's going to challenge the way we've thought about pricing energy, because we've taken it for granted that electricity is a volumetric product, because the major cost of electricity was the fuel you burn to make the electricity. So um, until a few years ago, it was just taken for granted. There was like base load, intermediate, and peaking power plants. Electricity was more expensive when it was scarcer. You called your peaking power plants on. It raised the prices for everyone. That's how power plants made money. And those were the load curves and the supply curves that we thought were kind of built into the product. What we're seeing now is that the renewables have a whole different cost curve. All the cost is up front, and then there's basically zero marginal cost. The gas is so cheap all the time that there's very few peaks in gas prices, and so the supply curves are getting flatter, and the load curves are changing because so much of the solar is behind the meter, and people are using energy more efficiently. You're not having those peaks either. So I think the challenge will be 
already in California where they can keep all of California electrified during the day with solar and they don't really need the gas turbines to come on until the sun goes down. Um, the challenge will be to price those resources that you need in a non-volumetric way because they're not going to make it up on volume if they're off all day long. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at people in the markets and outside the markets looking at um, reserve pricing, ramp pricing for ramp. Um, capacity markets were a way to get the missing money if you didn't need it on volume. Um, scarcity pricing, so if you make the price high enough when it's really needed to keep people on the hook for when the scarcity occurs. And pricing for things like vo uh, voltage and frequency in a different way than we did before, because we're not going to be able to do it on energy. But the one thing I'll say is we often talk about wind and solar as intermittent. They are intermittent, but they're predictable. The sun, you know, you can look on your phone, it's going to tell you when the sun goes down today. And it pretty much goes, you can do that for a year from now, it'll tell you when the sun is going down. And in the places in the country that have a lot of wind, wind forecasting has improved mm -hmm. dramatically. So the grid operators are learning how to dispatch it in a way together. It's not just like, oh my gosh, now the wind is gone, what will I do? Mm -hmm. It's new patterns that we're settling into. Absolutely. And I think this goes back to a comment you made earlier, just about operationally, um, improvements that have made, and I think you were talking about shipping and talking about how do we actually move goods to where we need to more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, but this is true about how do we view what is a good, how, uh, how can it be paid for, and how do we make sure that the market is set up to be able to pay for that mm -hmm. so we have what we need, because we've largely taken these things for granted. Like, and we're not alone in the U.S. Uh, well, the markets no. were set up at a time when most of the resources were fossil or nuclear, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing markets can work for. Markets are basically coordinated pricing in some kind of economic auction by using it to set a price, and that can work for anything you value, whether it's carbon or something else. You just have to set it up. Yeah. Cheryl, thank you for letting me put you on the spot. Um, it's great to have you with us. So I'm going to open this up to questions. What I would say is, um, so we're discussing Equinor's Energy Perspective 2019 report. Um, if you are online, please remember that you can use the hashtag CJEP events and our Twitter, ha Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy to ask a question. Um, and I think Caitlin will let me know if something comes in on that one. Um, and I'll try to maintain it here as well. So if we could just have hands if you have questions that you'd like to pose. So one right behind you, then we'll go to the back, and then we'll go across to Ed after that. Okay, and then fourth you. over there. Thank you. Uh, is lack of, of incentive what has stopped this plant of CCS at one megaton per year? Lack of incentives? Yes, exactly. Why this rate? So you're asking about like the carbon price, mm. and is, is that really what's keeping it exactly. going? Okay. Well, yeah, I, th I think uh, that's at least that's part of the picture, is that, uh, that um, if you don't have a sufficiently high carbon price, the incentive for somebody who has a, an emission source to pay to get rid, for, uh, rid of it, is not there, and therefore there's a lack of in, lack of financing ability to do the research and the necessary development of these types of facilities. It's because it, post combustion capture is not easy, uh, and it's costly. And then you have transport, and then you have this, uh, the storage as well. And, and of course, one of the issues is, and this is a very costly value chain. Uh, the CO2 molecule is larger than the methane molecule if it's gas that is the source of the CO2. So, so you need a pipeline that is bigger to bring it back to wherever you want to store it. And the distance between the emission source and where you want to store it is also something that, that will have to be handled. And, and we ha you have to simulate the kind of market, we think, for in order for that to be, uh, at least go faster than what it does now. So, so that's, so that's an in, and one key incentive there is, of course, I mean, you can incentivize it by regulation, but, uh, but at least an incentive also is a, is a price of carbon, we think. And, um, and we need a rapid change in that in order to facilitate more rapid growth in, in, in taking out carbon. And we have a report that just came out from Columbia, from the center today, uh, written by Noah Kaufman, who's one of our researchers there, mm -hmm. talking about the different carbon tax proposals in the U.S. and how putting a price on these things, what it would affect, and, and the different effects across society, all the um, environmental justice and different, you know, uh, sections of the population, what it would affect. It's an interesting report. Yeah. In the back, I think we have the next question, and then we'll come across here and make our way back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Eric. Um, Let's take a real-world example where a country has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in Germany to reduce their carbon footprint by having a very large percentage of their um, electricity coming from 
from wind power. And despite that, in the last 20 years, their carbon footprint has not only not gone down, it has actually increased a little bit. How do you reconcile your model and what you're projecting to a real world model where you have the highest prices for electricity in Europe, or second or third highest prices, and with the investment they've already made in a wealthy country that can do this, mm -hmm. and then you expect that developing countries like China and India to be carbon neutral or carbon free? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good question, and it's a good, par I mean, it's a good example of a paradox as well. And, and uh, uh, what it, I mean, what it serves to prove, I think, is also that, that, that it's, the, it's the overall scalability of this that is a big challenge. Uh, to some extent, you could say that part of the, part of the wind, wind electricity development in Germany, in a sense, was taken too early. Uh, and, but we could hope that they did it on behalf of all of us. They've, they've, con they've significantly contributed to the cost reductions that we now see, uh, developing that type of market. So, uh, so uh, as, as the costs come down, uh, we, think, we think that it's, uh, that, that it's possible, uh, but it will be a, an enormous challenge. And, and uh, uh, one of the good reasons for taking out coal is, uh, in the electricity mix is also local pollution. So, it, so, so once, you, I mean, once, once you get the pollution, uh, attacking pollution to go hand in hand with a technology that also helps us in reducing emissions while producing electricity, this could speed up. And that's what, ha what has to happen. So. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get the mic just because yeah. we can't hear anything online if we don't have the mic in front of yeah. you. And we're going to go to, I've got a yeah. whole slew it, of other questions, yeah. but can we follow up on this? Yeah, yeah no, it's, the, the, it's a good point. I mean, and, and, yeah. and you have to take out coal-fired electricity that is relatively new in order to make this renewal scenario happen. So we're going to go to Ed, I think you were next, um, if we can get the mic right there. And then we'll be making our way back and then over. Yep. Yeah, hello. Ed Crooks from Wood Mackenzie. I just wanted to ask also a bit more about carbon capture. Just check a couple of things. That number, your 1.5 billion tons, is that cumulative or is that per year? Or that, that that that's the annual uh, that's that's storage annual. capacity by 2050. Yeah, got it. And then just wondering if you could say a bit more about sort of what lies behind that. So is that mostly CCS on, on gas-fired power plants or is that in industry or where would you expect it mostly to be used? In, in that scenario, most, most of that will be in, in the manufacturing like cement and steel because we've taken out most of the carbon in the electricity sector anyway. So we, we have a little bit, but, uh, but uh, most of it will be on, on the manufacturing plant where you have to take it out. Yeah. So I think Akrosh was next and then the gentleman to his side and then the gentleman right in front of him and then we're going to switch to the other side. So you're next up after that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for this great and thought-provoking presentation. So at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the rapid rise of SUVs around the world. Uh, there are other movements to ban single-use plastics, uh, to flight shame people, especially in Scandinavia, or, or, or to, to reduce our individual carbon footprint in, in other ways. So in your view, uh, how much can consumer behavior, whether induced or, or, or voluntary, contribute and move the needle in, in terms of achieving the low carbon scenarios, or is it just uh, tweaking around the edges? No, I, I think uh, in, order, in order for, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I, I guess uh, one of the key black swans in this type of modeling is the link between purchasing power and individual behavior that affects energy demand. Uh, and and uh, if, if future consumers, uh, of which there will be 3 billion new middle class consumers by 2050 or something like that, if they have a very different uh, lifestyle, if you like, relative to their level of income compared to us, then, then this picture can be, it can be easier, if you like, to, to, to reach things like the renewal scenario than what it seems with our glasses on now. Um, but, but, but it, uh, and, and some, uh, some in, uh, uh, to have a macroeconomic or a, ma a global impact, uh, with, you, ha you have to move the needle in terms of incentivizing people to think efficiently or think differently. Um, there are only a few places in the world where we have the luxury of actually choosing our behavior, right? I mean, uh, if you think about where most of the energy demand is going to come from, it's in very poor countries, in, its, in countries where you have a lot of people and you have a lot of energy poor people. They don't have the luxury to choose either. So, so this, um, that, I mean, the, the flight shame discussion that we have in Scandinavia is exactly in Scandinavia because we fly a lot and we are rich. 
and we have relatively short distances to, <laughs> to all the places. So, so, so but, um, and by the way, I think, I think there are some numbers out there that uh, only 20% of the global population has ever flown. So, so, uh, so I, I think in order to, uh, and, and fundamentally also, if, if you, when you think about it, um, what is it that drives energy, energy use? It's, it's not only, it's not unnecessary comfort generally, right? I mean, it's, uh, but it's, in, we have some income elastic goods. I mean, there's a massive growth in energy demand now caused by live streaming of data. So you and I watching Netflix and HBO. A French study showed that the energy use there uh, and the emission with that will surpass that of total air traffic by 2025. So we better then decarbonize the electricity sector, right? So, so, so why do we use energy? What is it that when we get the money available, when we can afford a house with gadgets in them, what is it that drives our energy use? How do we move our body when we have spare time? Things like that. So, so, uh, so will we be fundamentally different when in 2050 or not? And those are the types of questions that will, how do, how do people get to work in 2050? Do they work in a different place than their homes? Is it all gonna be uh, digital working? That will lead to fewer work ready travel, probably more bored people, uh, because we don't exchange ideas with our mm -hmm. colleagues and we don't meet people on the bus, but you know. So, so but of course there is a limit, and, and consumer, uh, there's an impact on, consumer pressure will affect things like recycling of plastic. Hopefully it will, affect some of the producers of all the stuff. Why, why do they need three, three uh, types of packaging when they sell a cheese or a biscuit? Will that type of consumer pressure have an impact? It hasn't yet, but will it? So, so those types of, of uh, pressure will have an impact, but at a global scale to, to fundamentally change these lines, it's about pricing, incentives, and new technologies, basically, that makes it possible for another choice. So we have under 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna do this in a kind of grouping it together question. So we've got two people right here, right next to Akosh, and then the blue shirt right in front of him. So we're done right So there. my question would be quick. And quick. then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the two of you and gentlemen in the back on the aisle, I can only see your hand. Uh, oh, that'll be three, and then we'll go across the aisle and do some more on that side. So if you could each just state your question and then we'll answer them in groups. Quickly, yeah. Sounds good, cool. So, Really a practical question because you touched on the, on the three scenarios and I'd like to get back to that and I think in a number of occurrences you've described a number of challenges and heavy challenges for uh, some of them. Uh, in very simplistic terms, um, have you gone all the way to trying to put a probability on, on these three scenarios? All right, so probability on the scenarios. Oh, sorry. I. Um wanted to ask a, how you think about the role of innovation in these different scenarios. Do you, you sort of, uh, are the differences between the mainly in the realm of sort of economics and policy and deployment or do you, do you contemplate significantly different rates of improvement in the technology or even uh, technolo disruptive technological breakthroughs um, happening in any of the different scenarios? And then we'll go back to the gentleman on the aisle right there. And if we can, yeah, we'll grab him. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. I know you've mentioned uh, a lot of challenges, and there's obviously a lot, but one of the first things that you mentioned was a lack in leadership. How do you see Equinor leading, or, or how, how do you see all of these challenges being addressed if there's still uh, a lack of leadership? And I guess what's going on now for young professionals that are working in the energy industry, like myself, to really start addressing these challenges? Because I don't think it's very easy to just address everything. All right, I'm gonna uh, change my own rules and get that last question there, because then we can move fully over to the other aisle, side of the aisle. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, I would be very interested in knowing a bit more about the uh, Equinor's fossil fuel divestment strategy, and towards which scenario um, from the ones you explained is that strategy going to? Which, which strategy? And towards which scenario is the fossil fuel divestment strategy going to? So mm. if, if it's the renew scenario or, or the other two. Thank so you. We've got four questions mm. here. The great probability on scenarios, role of innovation, learning rates, lack of leadership, how do we do it without that? Um, and Equinor's fossil fuel mm. divestment strategy. And then we'll go over here next, Steve, and thank you. Yeah, the answer on probability, no, we don't. That's, uh, that's the, 
part of the scenario work. You don't assign probabilities to them. But uh, we hope that they span out and outcome space together. That is relatively likely, you know, in terms of. So, uh, and then you can think about how likely do you think that at least the start of these scenarios are. When you get to out to 2050, it's impossible anyway. Uh, how we think about innovation, I, th I think, well, there's imp implicitly hidden in all these, uh, in all these forecasts and all these pr projections, enormous amounts of in innovation that will happen, take place uh, from the demand side to the, to the supply side. Um, a difference between the scenarios is probably the speed at which those types of investments or in, uh, in, in uh, innovations will be deployed, how quickly they will uh, go to become significant market in markets. Um, in the uh, rivalry scenario, as an example, we explicitly say that, that uh, we don't trade with technology. So we, if you innovate something, you can't, and, and that's the case today, right? We, we, we cannot sell freely all types of technology to all markets in the world. And as a consequence, uh, the, uh, the development will be slower and it will also lead, to, and, and uh, in a rivalry case where you also have sanctions and, and trade wars, you have much lower economic growth. It means you have less tax revenues to governments, you have less money to put into research and development, et cetera, et cetera, to slow down the process. That's how we think about it, at least. And, uh, but, uh, but our ability to model that across uh, countries and sectors is uh, limited, to put it mildly. Um, yeah, lack of leadership. I, th I think uh, generally there's a lot of good leadership uh, around uh, the world. Uh, we will see more steward leadership as well, also in different parts of the energy sector, whether we're talking about car producers or energy companies upstream driven also by the increased focus from stakeholders and investors and employees and customers. So that's, that's happening. Uh, what I'm worried about is, the, is this sort of the, the, the lack of coherent uh, leadership and, and the, the combined leadership, if you like, on, on policy side, government side, uh, and, in the, uh, and uh, on us as consumers and then as industries, where, whereby the development is too slowly and we need some incentives. In particular, we as customers, consumers, need incentives that require tax policies, for instance, or fuel efficiency standards or or different types of regulation, which is difficult, which proves to be enormously difficult when you have short election periods, uh, a polarized setting, and you always have extremely visible losers, and you have invi invisible winners. And then the politicians tend to, 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 to be affected by their constituencies, and if you are a politician in Eastern Germany, you are concerned about jobs for the, those working in the coal industry. And legitimately so because you won't be reelected if you don't take in that into account. And that's the type of leadership that is too slow. I think within the energy companies, you're going to both, you're going to find, in many, in all the energy companies, basically, you're going to find an arena for young people who want to have an impact on this that is very open, very easy to come in with good ideas, and we're looking for solutions. So, and I think that is, that is gradually changing more and more rapidly. We have to figure out a way to do this. We have to figure out a way to do this with profit. And, and, uh, and uh, there's, a, there's, that's a, there's a ton of room for improvement there and come in with good ideas. So I think that's, uh, that's clear. Well, uh, on our investment strategies, whether it's in fossil fuels or it's in, in renewables and so on, for any given company, there's ample room to invest in all of this in all scenarios. Uh, and I, uh, uh, even, if you were, if, even if you're worried about top-line demand growth for any given product, whether it's the oil demand falling, for instance, in the renewal case, that white space means that there is investment there. You have, but the problem is, of course, that you have to be even more competitive. You have to do it with lower costs because you should believe that the price is going to be lower in that scenario than the others. But, but you, we, can, we can fit in our investments in all these scenarios, as long as we make them robust, as long as they're profitable, etc. So we have that type of discussion. So, uh, so uh, when, when we discuss the likely profitability of, a, of an investment, we, look, we, we discuss that within the context of things like these scenarios. So we're going to grab questions on this, and then we're going to call it a wrap after that. So gentleman in the white shirt with the black suit has been very patient, and then we'll come to the front. <laughs> and is there anyone on this side that I missed who has been? OK, so we'll do those two, and then we'll thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that there's a, a need for an energy transition. It's not, um, so what is the role of hydrogen and why is that not being uh, mentioned as part of your report? And then last question to the gentleman in the front. 
Thank you. Um, you mentioned the uh, aspirational goal maybe of having 20, uh, 15 to 20 percent investment in new energies. Is there a time frame for that? And what carbon price would incentivize you to do that? What carbon price would incentivize to go much higher? Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, on the role of hydrogen, uh, I, I have to apologize that I didn't mention it, but it's, but it's because it's still within that time frame, we think it's relatively small. Uh, we have a case in the report where we look at the a potentially a different pathway where hydrogen plays a larger role. Um, what you have to think, and, and it's difficult to model, so, so it's, and, it's, and it's, there's something about the costs of this, but, and, and you can see, uh, in energy sectors where we need molecules, hydrogen has and it can have a potentially important uh, role to play. Uh, where we, you can if you can use an existing infrastructure con containing methane today to spike the methane with increased amounts of hydrogen and ultimately go to all hydrogen in heating and cooling, for instance, you can foresee that as well. But, but it's, uh, currently the, the market is not there, sufficiently large, and, and we have to think about where is the hydrogen. Hydrogen does, doesn't exist, it has to be produced. So, so you, you, either we have too much, if you like, stranded electricity, so then you, you, you do electrolysis. You don't, if you don't have any place to do it with the electri uh, electricity, you can produce hydrogen and deliver it. So, but then you have to invest much more in renewables. Or you can produce hydrogen uh, from methane, and that's a known process. That's how we produce hydrogen today. But in order to do that without carbon emissions, we need much more carbon capture and storage. And, and so we play with those two in, in this uh, slight sensitivity. But it w we think it will have a role to play. For instance, in, in, in um, uh, heavy parts of transportation where we cannot use batteries, cruise shipping as an example where the, the role of hydrogen in fuel cells could be much larger. But, it, but it's, a, so it's a costly part of the energy spectrum, but we foresee that it can be done. And we are actually looking into developing some of those projects in, in, uh, in, in cooperation with uh, an electricity producer in the Netherlands. We're talking with, uh, with a steel producer in Germany, et cetera, so to see if we can get these oops, sorry, experimental projects up and running. There's also an initiative in Northern England to try and see how much hydrogen can you put into the gas network that they have there. So things are happening. Uh, the 15 to 20 percent uh, ambition that we have on, on new energy solutions, that's uh, within the next decade. So by 2030, we think we are, uh, and we hope we will be able to do that. Um, we are on our way uh, already, and actually well on our way, where we're given the two large renewable investments that we're going to make over the next couple of years. Um, what we have to make it uh, profitable. We have to make it uh, in, a, in a safe and... and uh, and conscious manner, and I think it, it, it's, it's less driven by things like a carbon price than about having access to the right projects. One of the frustrations, if you like, if you want more renewables, is that the, the availability of sites to do these investments is not sufficiently large. There's a large number of players now competing for all of these. Uh, so so it's, all, it's also about that, and, uh, and, uh, and of course it's also to make sure that we have the learning effects so that we do these, some of these projects in sequence, where we can learn from one project, then reduce the cost, and so on. So, uh, and if we're lucky, we can have some floating windmill projects as well, where we, which we try to do now, where we, which can be applied where they, don't have a, where they don't have a shallow continental shelf, California, coast of Japan as well. So, so we're trying to develop that as well, where you have a floating windmill in turbines. But then we have to do one project, learn, do another. So that's how you, because we can't do all of that at once. But there's something, uh, we need more, pro the industry, the world, needs more projects, and in particular in emerging economies where they need electricity. Well, thank you very much. Um, first, I'd like to thank Eric for uh, you know, your presentation and for answering all our questions. Thank you. I would also like to thank Caitlin Norfleet, who's out in the hall. Um, you probably got emails from her about this event. Thank you for signing us up, and as well to Megan and Steve for their help in getting around so we could get so many questions in. Um, so if I could have a round of applause for them, that would be yeah. great. Thank you. And then in particular, I would like to thank each of you for coming. Um, thank you for your active thoughts and questions. Thank you for bringing up hydrogen, because it was on my list that I didn't get to. So I really appreciated that one in particular. As I mentioned, the full video recording of this uh, will be available on our website in a few days. For a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website online for the Center on Global Energy Policy. Um, Caitlin, Megan, Steve, and many others are behind planning a large number of events, and we hope that you can join us when your schedule allows. Uh, we hope to see you again soon, and thank you for your attention.